with improvements in quality. This is a chance, but also a challenge, of course, because we have to be sure that the water quality improvement is efficient on the way through the aquifer here. Yeah. What you see here basically is the concept. We have a recharge zone. <clears throat> we infiltrate water with a kind of hazard in it that might still contain some hazard. But then when the water flows down gradient, we have a so-called attenuation zone. Yeah? And then we come to a recovery well. And the main target is that at the recovery well, the concentration are in the water that meet uh, environmental values, legal limits, for example. So this is the main concept. There are different ways to design such managed aquifer recharge schemes. The most often used one is just surface spreading basins. And if you have such a basin, then you need an unsaturated zone here that is permeable. And then finally, that water, water at one point reaches here the aquifer. You can also inject the water directly in, in the unsaturated zone, or you can inject it basically in the uh, aquifer directly. It might be an unconfined aquifer, it might also be a confined aquifer. So various technical designs are available and it always depends on the subsurface structure and on the water quality you have available, What of these, which of these methods you use. Yeah? This is how the systems look like, for example. This is a picture from the US, this is a picture from Israel, and uh, there are some requirements, basically, that you need if you would like to apply a method like this. Yeah? The infiltration basins, they should be somehow located in soils which are permeable, of course. The water has to infiltrate. Yeah? And I will show you later what is the infiltration rate that people are um, choosing here or that is needed in order to make the system efficient. Yeah? And um, the, 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 the soils should be fine enough for a good infiltration or for a good infiltration, but also to provide a good filtration, yeah? as we also want the quality improvement of that effluent when it infiltrates into the subsurface. So the best soils for such systems are basically fine sand, loamy sand, sandy loam. Yeah? That is basically what you need in order to get a very efficient MAR system. Yeah? What is also done, basically, these infiltration basins, and you see that here, are typically operated alternately, alternating between infiltration conditions, basically, and drying conditions. Yeah, and that is an important point. Yeah, you fill up the basin, you let the water infiltrate, and then you let the water the basin dry again. Yeah, and that is meant in order to. Uh, restore infiltration rates. Yeah? If you infiltrate water all the time, the infiltration rates will go lower and lower and lower because you might have clogging here. But if you do drying and flooding uh, consecutively one after the other, you maintain high infiltration rates. Just to give you an idea how much water is typically infiltrated, the annual infiltration amounts, yeah? so that uh, we call this hydraulic loading rates, um, are typically varying from, let's say, 15 meters per year to 100 meters per year, even more. Sometimes 200 meters per year are infiltrated here in such an infiltration basin. And if you know these values and you know the area that we have available to construct infiltration basins, then you can calculate how much water can be infiltrated, actually, how efficient that, uh, well, this, this, this technique can be. Yeah. Um, some people say, okay, if we do that in dry countries, then we have ev evaporation losses. Of course, there are some losses due to evaporation, but if we calculate how much that can be, then we see that we have a free water surface in very dry, warm areas, typically, then evaporation uh, costs us a meter per year, something like this, up to maybe three meters per year if you're in a very hot and dry climate. Yeah. However, the infiltration basins are not filled all the time, of course, and therefore this number is much uh, lower if you look into these basins here. So if you consider the high infiltration rates or the infiltration amounts and consider this one here, then this one is pretty much not very important. You lose just a few percent of that water due to evaporation. The rest basically is infiltration into the subsurface. And if you look here now into these soil aquifer treatment uh, scheme that we have basically a recharge zone and we have an attenuation zone. And in this attenuation zone, 
concentrations should decrease due to natural processes like microbial degradation, for example, of contaminants, then we can also say, okay, if we have managed aquifer recharge in a system where we have um, unconsolidated sandy material, then the distance from the recharge zone to, to, to fulfill the requirements of water quality is pretty short. But if you do this in fractured rock aquifers or in karstic systems, then you need a very large zone where these natural attenuation processes, these degradation of contaminants can be achieved. Yeah? So it makes much more sense to, you, sense to use managed aquifer recharge in a situation like this here. You have a sand aquifer compared to a karstic system. So in a karstic system, it's not very likely that you should use managed aquifer recharge as the water flow is very fast and there's not much time for contaminants, for example, to degrade. There are typically contaminants in the wastewater that we infiltrate, if we, for example, infiltrate wastewater. And then it depends on the hydrochemical conditions in the subsurface, whether we can improve water quality. I would like to show you one example here. Yeah? If you infiltrate water that contains some organic compounds, uh, then it depends, as I said, very much on the hydrochemical conditions in the subsurface, whether these contaminants, for example, are degraded or whether they reach the groundwater, something we uh, usually don't want. Oh, there's one person is asking a question. Osama Mohammed is raising his hand. Do you want to ask a question? If you want to do that, you can do that. Huh? Is that not the case? I also have the chat function open. So if somebody wants to put in a question in the chat function, of Zoom here, you will find that if you uh, go through the Zoom uh, here, then you can just put it in and I can answer questions if you want. You can also interrupt me if you want. Yeah, Osama, you have raised your hand. If there's a question, ask me. But you have to open your microphone. Yeah, you have your microphone closed, so I can't hear you. I'm not sure whether you know where that is. There's in the left corner at the bottom, there is a microphone. If you click on it, then you can talk. And I can hear you. Now I can't hear you. Okay, maybe you have to solve the problem and then you can ask again. Yeah, I don't think it works right now. So what I wanted to say here basically is that we have actually in the subsurface different hydrochemical conditions that might be uh, good for the degradation of contaminants. However, this depends very much on the compounds we have in the water and on the hydrochemical conditions. This one here is an example where we have, for example, a compound in the water which is called trihalomethanes. Yeah? Trihalomethanes are organic compounds that uh, are generated when you have water chlorinated. And I will show you later in, in field case where actually chlorinated water is infiltrated into the subsurface. If you have these trihalomethanes in the water and in the subsurface, you have aerobic conditions. Yeah? So we have oxygen available. Then this compound is hardly degraded. Yeah? The half-lives, meaning how long does it take to degrade this compound to a certain extent by 50%, this is basically hundreds of years if you are unlucky. Yeah? However, if you go to reducing conditions, nitrate reducing conditions, iron reduction, sulfate reduction, methanogenetic, then the half-life pretty much decreases over time. Yeah? Then you have, if you have highly reducing conditions, that compound is not a problem. Yeah? It's degraded very fast and you get rid of it. Yeah? And I will come later back to this point because you can use actually what we see here in order to manipulate, for example, infiltration basins in a way that you specifically produce conditions that can be used to degrade contaminants. That's the main idea. I come now oops, to the project, the first project. I would like to show you a couple of examples what we do. Yeah? The project is called MARSOL. And MARSOL means Managed Aquifer Recharge as a solution to water scarcity and drought. We did that project from 2013 to 2016-17. Yeah? And in that project, we had a lot of partners. Yeah? And the partners came from public research institutions, from universities, also from industry, and we had small, medium enterprises in here. 
And this is very important because the, the, the topic of Mahler is kind of complex. Yeah? So you need basically the universities for their theoretical background of everything. Also the public research institutions are needed actually to give a scientific backup to the system. But also industry will be in there because in the end they have to apply these technologies. And you see here that here are water companies involved because they see this technology as a chance to prepare for the water needs of the future. This, for example, here is the water supply company of Malta. Yeah? This one is the water supply company Edap of Greece. Yeah? They are responsible for all the water and wastewater uh, issues of Athens city. This is water supply company of Israel. So all these companies were involved because they find this topic so interesting and so important for the future. What we had in that project were field sites where we demonstrated how managed aquifer recharge can be used. Yeah? And you see here a map of southern Europe, the Mediterranean, northern Africa, and you see actually what field sites we used. Yeah? And we had in total eight different field sites. Uh, Ala Mustafa is raising the hand again. I see that on my screen. So if you have a question, Ala, then you can ask me, but you have to switch on your microphone. This is currently not working. So there's a hand raised. So if you have a question, ask. If this is not the case, maybe you press that knob, not on purpose, then I just continue with what I'm talking about. Yeah? But if you have questions, just ask me. Yeah? You have to just switch on your microphone or put it in the chat function. Yeah? So these are all the field sites we were looking at. Yeah? Two in Italy, yeah? one in Malta, one in Greece, one in Israel, and two in Spain, one in Portugal. And what I will show you now is some of the approaches at that specific field sites. Not all, but I will show you a couple of approaches that we had at that field site. Yeah? What we did, actually, we used for MAR in that field sites many different technologies and many different qualities of water. Yeah? We used treated wastewater, that was infiltrated. We used river water, yeah? in one case, that was taken and infiltrated for intermediate storage. Desalinated water was even used to infiltrate it into the subsurface. I will later show you a little bit about this field case too. Also, of course, rainwater harvesting. Yeah? If you have a city with a lot of roofs, then you can collect water in times when it's raining. Collect it, infiltrate it into the subsurface. And here you see that in that project, we had a lot of field activities. Yeah, we even constructed infiltration basins. And we tested the technologies that we had to infiltrate the water. And we closely monitored what happens with the water quality if we infiltrate these waters. Yeah. The first example I would like to show you is Barcelona, here in Spain. And here, basically, river water is infiltrated. That's here in Barcelona, the main idea. You see here an aerial picture of the Barcelona region. Yeah, this is Barcelona, a very large city. And they have a water problem because this is also a kind of water scarce country. And also, there's a lot of agriculture around here. Yeah? This is the point. And what they want to do, basically, they would... Uh, increase a strategic groundwater reserve in the area of Barcelona, and they tested that at that specific field site here, what you see here. But you see, this is the so-called Lobregat River. And the Lobregat River has a lot of water in winter times and not so much water in summer times. So what you can do is you take water out of that river here and they pump it in that first basin that you see here, here, that water basically is clarified in a way that, that, that particles will settle out. If the particles settle out, they pump the water to this basin here, and here this water infiltrates into the subsurface. Yeah? It's stored in the subsurface, and if you need it, you can take it out by wells which are located down gradient of the infiltration basins here. Yeah? There was one problem in that river water here, and I will address that in a short while. The river water was somehow contaminated here with nitrate. And I will show you later a solution for that nitrate problem that we have here. Yeah. So what you see here again, this is the Lobelgat River. These are the two infiltration basins. And then there's a lot of installations that was done here at that site. Yeah? Multi-level piezometers, tensiometers, in order to 
analyze how the water infiltrates into the subsurface. Yeah? Soil sampling, sediment sampling was done in order to see how the soil is affected by that infiltrating water, how the microbiology develops in that soil, which can be used to degrade contaminants. Yeah? And you see here the activities that happened here on the side. Yeah? Pump test, tracer test, to see the hydraulic conductivity of the subsurface. How much water can we infiltrate into these basins here? And you, you see an overview, this is the basin, this is how they infiltrate the water into the subsurface. And they also, of course, monitor the infiltration rates. Yeah? And what they also did is they analyzed how long can we infiltrate before our infiltration rates decrease somehow. You see here, this is the water level, and this shows somehow over time how much water can infiltrate into such a basin. And you see, if you have a long wetting period, then the infiltration rates are pretty low. But in, then if you dry it again, then the infiltration rates are increasing. This is one indication that you need wetting drying cycles when you do this for recharge. Second field site I would like to show you is here in the south of Portugal. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And also here, they have water problems because it's a dry country, plus they have agriculture like crazy. And this, of course, puts a lot of pressure on the water resources. What they did is a very interesting approach. Yeah? They also had, in a way, a river, but the river has no water at all in summer times. But in winter times, there's a lot of water flowing because in winter time they have rainfall. And then there's a lot of water flowing to the Mediterranean Sea. Actually, that water is lost. Yeah? So what you need actually is storage, intermediate storage. In winter times, there's also not so much demand for the water. Yeah? You have water available, but you don't have the demand. In summer times, you need the water, but there's no water flowing in the river. So what did, this, uh, did the guys do in Portugal here? What they did actually, they prepared the base of that river in a way that it's now highly permeable. Yeah? So some sections of that river bed here, this is a picture from summer, of course, no water in it. But what they did, they prepared the base of that river bed in a way that if there is water, this infiltrates very fast into the subsurface. And you see how much effort they did, basically. This is the prepared riverbed. And if there is now water coming in winter times, it will infiltrate through this highly permeable zone and can be taken out in summer times when they need it down gradient because then it's part of the groundwater. And that's the main idea these guys had here in Portugal. You, you see here, these are our partners preparing here that sections of the river for high infiltration rates. And what they did here is they use a tracer. This is basically salt. Yeah? And if there's water coming and they flooded it with water here to test the system, the salt dissolves. And then you can monitor down gradient how this plume of infiltrated water now moves into the aquifer yeah? because the salt increases the electrical conductivity of the water. So it's very easy to measure. Yeah? And here you see there's a well, they infiltrated the water, and now they monitor here the breakthrough of that water in the down gradient section. And further down gradient, you might have extraction wells, yeah? where you take out the water in times when you need it. I would like to stress this point again. Managed aquifer recharge is Basically, you use the subsurface as an intermediate storage because if you have water available and you don't need it, for example, in winter times, this basically goes to the Mediterranean Ocean is lost. But if you can store it in the subsurface, you can use it in summer times when there is a high demand for water, avail for water availability. Yeah? There's another one I would like to show you. And the next example is Malta. Yeah? And what they do basically on this island here in the Mediterranean, they infiltrate actually treated wastewater. And they do that for a very specific reason. And this is uh, basically indicated in the pictures. This is the main water treatment plant on Malta. Yeah? And what they did in former times with this water, and this is typically all over the world, you have that treated wastewater and you just put it into a surface river and it goes to the Mediterranean or you let it go directly into the Mediterranean. Yeah? So you lose basically nicely treated water, 
to the Mediterranean Sea, and then it's lost, actually, and you can't use it anymore. What they do now with this water, they have now a series of wells here along the coastline, and that nicely treated water, in the end they do it actually with a membrane process to make it really clean, they infiltrate the treated wastewater here along the coastline to uh, increase the groundwater table. The problem they have here is that due to the extraction of groundwater for agricultural purposes, the, the seawater moves here into the aquifer along the coast. And now they are generating here an hydraulic barrier by infiltrating here this nicely treated wastewater. Does not look that nice here in this case, but this is just the first step of the treatment. This is aeration in order to degrade organic uh, compounds in the water. Yeah? So they combat with that water, which is infiltrated along the sea here, they combat um, seawater intrusion by having this hydraulic barrier. Yeah? And they increase the availability of fresh water in the coastal aquifer also. Yeah? And this water is used, actually. There's one more example, and this one is in Israel here. And what they do, actually, they infiltrate desalinated seawater. At the first sight, that might be a very strange idea. Why would you desalinate seawater and then infiltrate it into the subsurface? However, there's a reason for this, actually. Israel has now a lot of desalination plants. They have basically five desalination plants, and they produce basically all the water that goes into the public water supply in that state. Yeah? Actually, the production costs of one cubic meter of desalinated water in these membrane processes, these are reverse osmosis membranes that you see here, are just 70 euro cent per cubic meter. I'm not so uh, sure whether you are familiar with euro cent. Let's say this is 50 American cent. Yeah? So 70 euro cent is 50 American cent. Half a dollar is the price to desalinate one cubic meter of seawater. This is, from my perspective, not that expensive, yeah, if you consider this price. I'm not sure how much you have to pay for your drinking water that you get out of the tap at home. In Germany, if I get one cubic meter of drinking water to my house, this costs me basically two euros fifty about yeah, in the city where I live. One cubic meter of water costs me two euros fifty. Yeah? The wastewater I'm generating, and they say if I get one cubic meter of drinking water, I will generate one cubic meter of wastewater. So in addition to the 250 I have to pay for the drinking water, they charge me another two euros for the wastewater. So basically getting one cubic meter of water from our water supply company costs me 4.5 euros. Yeah? And if I see that number here, desalination costs me 70 euro cent, basically that's a very good price. Of course, you have to distribute the water. There has to be a piping system going to the cities and stuff like this. But still, this is kind of competitive, I have to say. The price is down from very high numbers, let's say 20 years ago, to this number, 70 euro cent per cubic meter. Also, what they do, these plants work basically 24 hours, seven days, yeah? And also there you have times when the demand is not very high or when there is some basically maintenance in the distribution system. They were generating here nicely desalinated water, but they couldn't discharge the water into the public water supply system because it was not needed or there were some maintenance systems. At that time, actually, this nicely treated water went back to the Mediterranean because they couldn't store it. Yeah? It's a very strange uh, thing to do. You treat it, you pay money for it, but then it goes back to the Mediterranean. The reason is these work 24 hours, 7 days. Yeah? So what they did, basically, now there is here in that area, you see here, there's, there's Haifa, there's Tel Aviv, there's a coastal aquifer, and the coastal aquifer is already depleted in groundwater because there was a lot of pumping of water. Yeah? So now they infiltrate this desalinated water. Here you see that this is the pipe coming from the desalination plant. They infiltrate that into the coastal aquifers. They have, of course, also wetting drying phases, and this is basically the storage solution for that excess of desalinated water they have. The unsaturated zone below this infiltration basin is almost 25 meters. 
So that shows me you have 25 meters of sediments with a porosity, let's say, of 25%, where you can store a huge amount of waters. Yeah? And that is basically done. I would like to give you one idea how large that can be. In Israel, they do that since 20, 30, 40 years, even almost 50 years. They infiltrate also the complete treated wastewater of Tel Aviv. Yeah? This is about 130 million cubic meters per year. They are infiltrated here in these recharge basins. The water comes from the central water treatment plant in Tel Aviv. It's infiltrated here in these basins. You see that here also from a kind of uh, up view. And around these infiltration basins, they have the wells that recover actually the water. It's infiltrated, create basically a kind of cone. The water flows then basically from here into this region. And then it's taken out again and it's used for irrigation purposes. Yeah, And this is all the wastewater of Tel Aviv. Yeah? Nothing goes to the ocean anymore. It goes all into a wastewater treatment plant. It's nicely treated. It's infiltrated. It's recovered with these recovery wells, and it's going to agriculture. Yeah, that's the main idea. And this is one of the prominent examples we have worldwide to do this. Yeah? From these field sites, this was a nice overview, I think, of field sites we have. And what we learned, actually, is that we have a lot of technical designs available and we have really vast experience now with the operation of such sites. Yeah? And the operational times, they range from almost 50 years. That was this Menashe case I just presented. Yeah? And we have also, of course, recent installation. Yeah? It was demonstrated, so that's also one part of the story, that the technical solutions we have are pretty well understood. Yeah? They are pretty efficient in their operation. And they're also cost effective. Also, this is a case we have to consider. You have to be cost effective. Yeah? If you are not cost effective, nobody will do that. But the installations they are presented to you, they all produce water with cents per cubic meter, actually. Yeah? It's not expensive to do this. If you have water available, that would go just to the sea. However, you can take it, infiltrate it, use it later. This all sounds very positive, of course. It is positive, I have to say. But there is also some things we have to consider. Yeah? And this is the main lesson, actually, we learned from the project also. The quality aspects of the water sources used for MA are a major concern. Yeah? Especially, the of, especially the presence of micropollutants and we have that in water, and I'll show you that later also. For example, pharmaceuticals. Yeah? We find that in treated wastewater. Yeah? And we find that in receiving surface waters. We have to consider that. So if you infiltrate these waters, you have to be aware that you might have compounds in that water you would not like to see in the groundwater. In Europe, for example, this is a kind of big problem concerning legal aspects. In Germany, for example, you are not allowed to infiltrate something into the aquifers that could deteriorate the quality of the aquifer, of the water in the aquifer. Yeah, it's a very important point. And therefore, you have to have a good idea what happens in the subsurface with the water you infiltrate. I would like to show you that now a little bit more in detail, what I mean with this water quality aspects during the infiltration of these different water sources into the subsurface. What I presented in the first half of this lecture was that you have different ways to infiltrate water into the subsurface. Yeah? But you can do it, you can flood the area in basins, yeah? you can infiltrate that water then through the unsaturated zone, into the saturated zone, into the aquifer basically. You can also do it with ditches, yeah? also this is a possible uh, option, basins, or you can directly inject it into the aquifer, that water you have. If you do that, you have to really consider two things. First, if you do it with this method here, then you have the whole unsaturated zone where the water passes through in order to decrease, for example, contaminants. Yeah? So the retention capacity of the subsurface to improve water quality is pretty high here, but it's pretty low, of course, here, because the water is directly injected into the aquifer. Yeah? 
Therefore, the quality of that water you are infiltrating has to be pretty good here, yeah, because you inject it into the aquifer, and if the water is of poor quality, you have an aquifer with poor quality water. This is something you don't want. If you do it here, you can improve the quality of the water while it trickles through this unsaturated zone to the aquifer. So this is basically uh, what you have to, uh, to be concerned of. You have a retention capacity here, yes, you don't have it here, so the source quality water should be good here and can might not be that good here. What we have to consider here, and this is what I would like to focus a little bit on now, is what hydrogeochemical process in the subsurface are going on and how we can use it, make advantage of these. Yeah? The Mars scheme and operation is, of course, very important. Yeah? You might have ponds, ditches, wells, all makes different aspects here in the scenario. The quality of water, source water is, of course, very important. What compounds do I have in the water and how do I get rid of these compounds? Yeah? Do I have continuous infiltration, wetting drying cycles? There are many other reasons that I could mention here that uh, are important in the operation of such mass schemes. Yeah? And then, of course, the soil or aquifer characteristics are important. Soil type, yeah? permeability. Permeability is residence time. Residence time is time available for reactions going on in the subsurface. Yeah? Thickness of the unsaturated zone. Yeah? I need a thickness of at least a few meters First, to store a substantial amount of water. Second, that water quality can be improved in the unsaturated zone. And the geochemistry is important. Yeah? Do I have clay minerals, organic carbon, whatever is in that basically material here might have an effect on the water quality that I'm infiltrating and might improve even water quality. Yeah? So one of the main focuses of our project was we need to better understand the processes in the subsurface. And we would like to tailor the conditions in the subsurface to optimize contaminant attenuation. So we have to know what is going on here. Yeah? You have your water with a certain quality. And if I infiltrate it, I have to make sure that the quality is getting better. Yeah? Because then at one point you reach your groundwater and you would like to recover the water. And in that first project, we specifically looked into that zone here. What happens to different water qualities if I infiltrate it into the subsurface? I'll show you one example. And this is a very nice example how you can manipulate such an infiltration basin in order to achieve a certain treatment goal. This again is the case study in Barcelona. Yeah? And this is the infiltration basin where the water from that river is infiltrated. The river now has nitrate yeah? and nitrate concentrations are high in the river but you do not want to have these nitrate concentrations of course in the groundwater because later you pump that water up and you would like to use it. So one idea was and this goes back to something I said initially redox zones in the subsurface one idea was to manipulate this infiltration basin in a way that it enables the degradation of nitrate. Yeah? What they did and you see that here, they implemented a layer of organic material, yeah, and that was basically a compost, a vegetal compost, yeah, so there was 60 centimeters of a reactive layer constructed in this infiltration basin. Why would you construct organic matter here in that infiltration basin? background is we have nitrate. We would like to get rid of the nitrate. And maybe you remember what I showed you initially. Yeah? Redox zonations. Yeah? And what is done by having um, organic matter in the subsurface is you initiate the degradation of organic matter. If you infiltrate the water, that water contains oxygen. Yeah? And the oxygen first is used to degrade organic matter. Yeah? So if the water infiltrates through this reactive layer here, first oxygen is consumed to degrade the organic matter. Yeah? However, you don't have much oxygen. You have just 10 milligrams per liter of oxygen in the water, but you have a very thick layer here, and you see that here of this compost. If the oxygen is consumed, then the next redox reaction starts, yeah? mediated by bacteria. So what the bacteria do is they take now again that organic matter, this is an abbreviation of the organic matter, and then they use the nitrate 
yeah, in order to produce N2 gas and bicarbonate CO2 and water. The bacteria gain energy by this reaction. Yeah? And for the infiltrated water, of course, the advantage is you get rid of the nitrate. You make advantage of a redox reaction. Coming from oxidizing conditions, consuming all the oxygen in that rich layer here, then the nitrate is consumed. They could show this is happening in the field also. So what, you, what they did, they, they were taking this basically organic matter and they uh, were then monitoring how nitrate, this is the nitrate here, is degraded over time. And even after years of operation of that reactive layer, still nitrate is degraded perfectly in that organic rich layer. So this is an example how you can use basically different methods in water infiltration to improve water quality. Yeah? They measured nitrogen isotopes to prove what degradation mechanisms is going on and they proved that this is the mechanism that is going on. And in this case here, and I would like to go back once, this case here, this layer enables in quality improvement of the water because you degrade now nitrate in the infiltrating water. Yeah? So nitrate is easy to do. I would really stress that. Nitrate is not a big problem. Yeah? There's clear, if you have reducing conditions, the nitrate is degraded. What we also did in that study is we looked, we looked into the compounds that you find in treated wastewater. And this is water coming out of a wastewater treatment plant. Yeah? And these are wastewater treatment plants that operate basically with a pretty good performance. However, the problem that we face is, for example, pharmaceuticals. Yeah? And in all wastewaters in Europe and all over the world, you have pharmaceuticals in the water that comes out of a wastewater treatment plant. This is discharged by us, basically. Yeah? If we take pharmaceuticals, we also discharge these pharmaceuticals later into the wastewater, and the wastewater treatment plants are typically not prepared to deal with pharmaceuticals. Yeah? So in the treated wastewater in Europe, we found almost 300 different compounds. Yeah? And there were, we also looked at the literature, there were about 10,000 publications on basically pharmaceuticals and treated wastewater. There are more problems, of course, but this is the main problem, pharmaceuticals and treated wastewater. What happens with treated wastewater? Pretty clear, it goes out of the wastewater treatment plant and here in, 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 in Europe, basically, it goes into a surface river. Yeah? For example, in Darmstadt, it goes finally to the Rhine. Yeah? And then the water goes to the North Sea. Yeah? So if you now look into the surface waters, yeah? and this is data from surface waters now, then you find the same compounds that you find, of course, in the treated wastewater. Yeah? You find it in kind of lower concentrations. There's dilution, of course, but you find them. And here, this is just going by the alphabet, C to E, carbamazepine, for example, in treated wastewater, up to 70 micrograms per liter. You find it also in the surface water. Yeah? Diclofenac, yeah? So you find it basically 100 micrograms per liter in treated wastewater. Yeah? And around the world, this is the same problem. You find it, of course, also in the surface waters. If you take now the surface waters to infiltrate that into the subsurface, you have to be concerned about these compounds, of course. Yeah? And that is the major problem we are facing by further developing this technology. Maybe all of you at one point had already diclofenac taken. This is a very common pharmaceutical, and most of us, I think, in their life have many uh, different occasions where we take diclofenac because it's for your joint. If it, you have pain in your joints, then your diclofenac is a very good tool to this. Yeah? However, it creates a problem, of course, in the wastewater. We did a lot of different experiments with wastewaters, and uh, we had here a column set up. You see this is in our laboratory here. These are columns. In the columns we had soil from a field site in Greece, where actually um, infiltration basin was constructed. And we took then wastewater here from the vicinity of Darmstadt, because we couldn't bring it, of course, from Greece. And we infiltrated that wastewater here into this column. Yeah? as you would do it in the field. And then in that column, we monitored a lot of different parameters. Yeah? How much oxygen is in the water? Yeah? What are the redox conditions in the column? We saw a while ago that the redox conditions are very important, of course. Yeah? 
and we took samples to analyze them for removal efficiency for some compounds. And the pharmaceuticals we used, you see here, these were used in our experiment. Yeah? Carbamazepine, for example, diclofenac, ibuprofen, this is also a very common pharmaceutical. Also, this is for your joints. If you have some pain in your joints, you take ibu. That's how we call it here, ibuprofen. I think it's in your country the same story. We also used antibiotics, yeah, sulfometoxazole, sulfometazine, doxycycline. So these also were infiltrated into this column. And the idea was first to see what happens with these compounds when they infiltrate, and in the next step to design the infiltration basin, so this is part of an infiltration basin, so to speak, to design it in a way that these compounds are attenuated, degraded, yeah, and do not present a risk for the groundwater anymore. I would try, like to show you some results. Yeah? These are not so easy to get, but I will try to explain it. Yeah? So what we see here are two columns. Yeah? And these two columns now are um, basically operated in different ways. The first column, column A, was continuously infiltrating treated wastewater. Yeah? And if you do this, that has an effect on the redox conditions in the column. Yeah? We have reducing conditions in the column because the oxygen is consumed right away, and then we have reducing conditions in the column. Column B, we had operated in a way that we have wetting and drying cycles. Yeah? Wetting and drying cycles mean you infiltrate water, then you stop doing that. Yeah? And if you stop doing that, then you have oxygen again diffusing into the soil column because it's not saturated with water anymore. Yeah? So you change here between reducing and oxidizing conditions. You have three pharmaceuticals here in this case, carbamazepine, diclofenac, nacproxene, and we infiltrated that wastewater into these columns for 16 months. Yeah? And we monitored what happens. This is column A continuous infiltration of that water, wastewater, treated wastewater. And I'll show you now that three pharmaceuticals, carbamazepine, diclofenac, naproxen. And you see major differences in what happens in the columns. And I would like to quickly explain, if you have blue colors, and this is in the depths of the column, infiltrating in 12 centimeters, in 27 centimeters, and 70 centimeters, you have the blue color means that just the naproxen goes through the column without any change in concentration. However, you have some sorption, interaction with the matter, with the material in the column, and you might have degradation. Yeah? And in the case of naproxen, while the water infiltrates into the column, 0 centimeters, 12, 27, 72, you degrade naproxen almost completely. Yeah? So that means reducing conditions are very good for the naproxen to be degraded. Yeah? On the other hand, you look into the carbamazepine, nothing is degraded. It goes through the column, but some of the, the carbamazepine also sorbs to the material that we have in the column. But we have, in the end, we have breakthrough of that carbamazepine through that column. Yeah? So nothing is degraded. You don't see these greenish colors. For diclofenac, it's a little bit different. It also breaks through. Some is sorbed and some is degraded under these conditions only reducing conditions in the column. Now we go to column B, where we have wetting and drying cycles. And we see the same presentation here now. And what we see now for naproxene, not much changes. Yeah, naproxene is not uh, affected by change between reducing and oxidizing conditions. However, for the diclofenac, now you see a major difference. Yeah? Diclofenac is basically also removed to 60% while it goes through this column here. And the reason is we change now from reducing to oxidizing conditions again. That means diclofenac is degraded under oxidizing conditions, not perfectly, but this shows us that we can do something. If you have reducing conditions, it's not degraded. If you change between reducing and oxidizing conditions, it's degrading. Yeah? Carbamazepine is not much influenced. There might be a little bit of degradation, but not much. So carbamazepine is a real problem. Yeah? It breaks through without much degradation. Here you can do something. If you have diclofenac as the main component, you better change between oxidizing and reducing conditions. You can do that by wetting drying cycles. So this is one point I would like to stress. So the degradation. However, this is also just half of the story. 
And this is also important to realize. What I show here is naproxen degrading. Yeah? So I don't find the naproxen in the water anymore. But what does it mean? And that's the next complication we are facing here. This is not done here with, uh, uh, the next slide is not on naproxen, this is on ibuprofen, and this is not data from us, this is from Switzerland, from the AIRVAC. They degraded ibuprofen, and what you do when you degrade, for example, ibuprofen, you generate all these different degradation products. And that also is a problem, of course. Yeah? Typically, you don't analyze for all these different compounds. Yeah? You just analyze for ibuprofen, ibuprofen is gone, and you are not analyzing for these compounds. And you don't know the risk of these compounds also. A legal limit might exist for ibuprofen, but not for all these different compounds that you might generate while you degrade these compounds. So this is something we are currently working on. How to deal with that issue? Another example, caffeine. Caffeine is not a problem, but also caffeine produces during degradation numerous degradation products where you don't have any idea how they behave in the environment. One more example, bisphenol R, yeah? that is also a compound that you find in treated wastewater. If you degrade this one, and this can happen in the subsurface, you generate again many, many, many different compounds, which might all present a problem in the groundwater later. So this is the major problem we are facing with MAR installations, and this is what our research is about now. We would like to design infiltration basins that are specifically tailored to degrade specific compounds. I would like to show you one more point which I find important. We were talking about the degradation, yeah? and I showed you some slides on degradation. I will show you one more thing which is related now to sorption. Also, this is something that happens, and you see that color here, for example, this compound and this compound, they sorb on the aquifer material. Yeah? What does sorption mean? Yeah? And this is something which is uh, a picture I saw my students many times in my uh, presentations here. This shows how a contaminant, and basically this is a contaminant that we are talking about, distributes here in the subsurface. And what you might have, you might have three phases. You might have the gas phase, the water phase, the soil phase. And we are talking right now about the water phase and the soil phase. Yeah? And this is the sorption we see. Yeah? The stuff goes from the water phase into the sorbed state. Yeah? And if you do this, and if you look at into this system here, and this is what we have in these columns, you can define the concentration that is sorbed now on the sediments and the concentration in the water phase that you have. And if you have these two concentrations, you can come up with a distribution coefficient, yeah? Kd, which is the concentration in the soil divided by the concentration in the water. The higher the Kd, the better the resorption, yeah? And you need to know what is the sorption here, and you need to know what is the KD, how does a specific contaminant distribute in that two-phase system here, soil and water. You can calculate that actually by considering two parameters. This one here is the fraction of organic carbon in the soil. And what we found, and many people found that of course, is that these organic contaminants, they sorb on organic matter in the soil. Yeah? And they sorb stronger when the compound you have has a higher hydrophobicity. And this can be ex expressed with the so-called KOW, the octanol water partition coefficient. I'm not so sure how your background in chemistry is. These are parameters you can look up for compounds. Yeah? If you have a compound, you would like to know the KOW, you can Google it, basically. Then you can calculate, basically, on this equation here, how it distributes between... Um, organic matter, and then you can calculate the KD. And that is basically, uh, this is sorry, it's in German, this basically shows you types of organic matter you have in soils. And this is where our contaminants sorb onto. Yeah? And it's a very important factor. And then you can develop sorption isotherm models. This is the concentration of the water phase, the concentration of the solid phase, sorption basically. You can have linear isotherms. The higher the KD, the more sorption. You can also have freundlich isotherms, and the isotherm is not linear anymore, it's somehow curved. 
basically the equation is a little bit more complicated, or you can have even Langmuir type isotherms. This is also again the concentrations of water, and then this is a normalized concentration because Langmuir means you have a monomolecule a layer of the contaminants on the particles in the subsurface. So many different models are available to predict how sorption works. I would like to show you related to this one experiment we did, which I also find very uh, interesting. Yeah? We did sorption experiments now with three pharmaceuticals. Yeah? And sorption means you have, wait, I'll show you something. You have a while, you have a while, oops, there you go. You have the water in it. In that water, you put, for example, carbamazepine. And then you monitor how that carbamazepine soaps on the soil that you have in here. Yeah? And then after some time, you measure how much is still in the water and how much is here in the soil. That's what you do in a batch experiment on sorption. Yeah? We did that with three compounds, carbamazepine, ibuprofen, sulfometaxazole. And there's a very important point now here. This is the KOW that shows us how strong this compound will sorb. And this ibuprofen, the highest KOW, and then there is something we call the PKA. And this is a value above that value. The, um, the, the compound has a charge below that value. The compound is neutral. Yeah? So it depends very much on the hydrochemical conditions, how this compound is basically present. Yeah? So this one is, had a PKA of, of 13.9, meaning at a pH of 13.9, it changes from neutral to charged. Yeah? So in normal conditions, this is always a neutral compound, the carbamazepine. These two compounds, ibuprofen and sulfamitaxazole, they change at pH values, which are not that far away from what we expect in waters. Yeah? Seven is the neutral, and here at 5.8, this changes from anionic to neutral. If you go lower, it gets neutral. And also this one changes from anionic to neutral at a pH of 4.9. If you have a neutral compound, it will nicely sorb. If you have an anionic compound, it will not sorb. Yeah? And that is basically what we were looking at here. And I'll show you some of the results. Looks kind of messy, but I'll explain it to you. Yeah? This is the pH, and that is the KD. And the KD, I told you, the KD expresses how strong is sorption. The higher the value, the more sorption. And for these compounds now, you see that we have a huge effect if the pH changes on sorption. In that acidic range, all these compounds sorb pretty well because they are all neutral, and neutral means they sorb well. If you go up with the pH, this compound here now, this compound here turns to be negatively charged and then the sorption dramatically decreases. This compound also goes negative here in that pH and also the sorption dramatically decreases. This compound stays more or less uncharged. So the sorption is not changing so much. I show you this because I would like to make, um, to make the point that even if you have compounds that are sorbing and you remove it from the water phase by sorption, slight changes in the pH might remobilize these compounds. This gives us a chance. If we manipulate pH, for example, we can sorb these much stronger but it's also a problem because if pH changes in a different direction, then they would be remobilized. Yeah? Just to show you how complicated these situations are. I would like at the end to show you a little bit about Germany because you might think Germany is not a water scarce country. Why do we use managed aquifer recharge? Is this important for us? Why do we do all this research? It is. Yeah? In Germany, we practice managed aquifer recharge since many decades. We don't do it in the way I showed you just. We do it typically with so-called river bank filtration. Yeah? So you have a river, like the River Rhine, and you have close by, you have wells. And you pump the water then from the aquifer, and you create a gradient from the river into the aquifer. And this is basically what we have in Germany in many places, river bank filtration. The main option of MAR is here not involved, the temporal storage. Yeah? We pump, the water comes from the river into the aquifer, we pump it out. And if we stop pumping, then we will not have water from the river anymore flowing into the aquifer. So this is what we basically have right now. That is the typical situation, riverbank filtration. 
that might be due to the fact that we don't have managed aquifer recharge, that we do not have the pronounced seasonality in rainfall compared to the Mediterranean, compared to also maybe your country. Yeah? But in times of climate change, we might experience more summers like 2018. I'm not sure how the summer 2018 was in your country. You have dry conditions almost every year, but in Germany, 2018 was the driest year recorded. Yeah? And that created a lot of problems also for our water supply. And I will show you why Germany also needs managed aquifer recharge, and we do manage aquifer recharge. The first thing I would like to stress is this climate change. Yeah? And this is a very nice presentation by a research institute here in Germany, the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research. They plotted something they call a drought indicator in the upper soil. Yeah? So how dry is the soil? And they calculated that from the years 1952 to 2019. And these brown colors show you extensive droughts. Yeah? So we have years where we have really drought years, 1959, of course, there was a very dry year, but then we have kind of wet years following. We have sometimes several years which are not very wet, but what we have in the last 10 years, you see almost every year has very brown colors. And this 2018 was dramatically brown. Yeah, so meaning a very, very dry year. Yeah. First reason why also we would like to have managed aquifer recharge, yeah, because we need to enrich our resources. Second one, a heterogeneous, heterogeneous spatial distribution of rainfall. Yeah? Also, this is important. Yeah? Precipitation in Germany, long year average. And you see that we have some areas where we have two meters of rainfall. We have other areas where we have just 500 millimeters of rainfall. Yeah? And a very heterogeneous distribution. This is the long year average, 1961 to 1992. Two meters, more than two meters here in the Alps. Munich is here for 500 millimeters just in a year here in the Magdeburg area. It gets more dramatic if you look into the year 2018. Yeah? Here, the whole eastern part of Germany in 2018 was extremely dry. Yeah? Less than 400 millimeters rainfall per year, which is extremely low for our climatic conditions. This is where I live here, yeah, in this area. Also, this was extremely dry. And in some of the cities here, or the small villages, not in the cities, but in some of the small villages, we have cars with, with tank cars going to the villages to bring them water because the public water supply didn't work anymore. Second reason why we need a kind of intermediate storage for waters. Yeah? Third reason. And these reasons basically are true for all countries, basically. Yeah? You have climate change, you have heterogeneous distribution of water resources, and the, sec the third one I would like to make is that we have basically a heterogeneous temporal distribution of water. Yeah? This is the so-called climatic water balance. Yeah? Difference between the sum of precipitation in a year and the sum of potential evapotranspiration about grass. Yeah? That just simply means if you have basically a year with a lot of precipitation, then we have a positive balance. And if you have a year with low precipitation, we have a negative balance. But you can also divide one year into different, basically, um, the parts. You have here, for example, spring, summer, autumn, winter. And you see here that climatic water balance plotted. Yellow means we have enough rainfall and we have basically balance with this the evaporation. Yeah? Orange red means we have not much rainfall, so we have a negative balance. There's more evaporation potentially going on. Green means, uh, to blue means we have a positive um, ratio between the precipitation and the potential evapotranspiration. And what you see in spring and summer, we have many red colors, especially in the, the eastern part of Germany. And that means in this time of the year, spring, summer, we have a very low availability of water. But, of course, we have a very high demand for water. This is the growing season for agriculture. Yeah? So they need water, but we don't have much water available. If you go to autumn and winter, we have a high availability of water yeah? because we have rainfall, it's not so warm, there's a lot of water available, but a low demand. Yeah? We don't need that water, actually, because this is not the growing season. Agriculture does not need any water. And that is basically the mismatch we are facing. How can you adjust such a mismatch? 
temporal storage. Yeah. Managed archival recharge could be the solution also for this one here, because if you have high demand but low availability, you need to prepare for this. And you can do that when you have high availability but low demand by having intermediate storage. One more point I would like to make what the problem in Germany is. Yeah? The chemical status of the groundwater is the next problem we have. This map shows us groundwater bodies in Germany which are in poor chemical state and this is due to nitrate. Yeah? I think in your country nitrate is also a problem. And what we have in Germany basically is that we have a lot of aquifers. Yeah, here, this is where I live. Everything is red because we have high nitrate concentrations in the groundwater. Especially in the northern part, we have very high nitrate concentrations in the groundwater and that gives a problem for water supply. Yeah, you can't drink that water, you have to treat it. Or you have to get it from somewhere else. So this is the fourth factor why we need in Germany also a better management of our water resources. I would like to show you one thing which is also interesting. Yeah? People are talking about the problem of nitrate since decades. Yeah? And there's a lot of money invested in Germany to solve that problem. Yeah? However, if you look over the years, this is years 2008 to 2018, and this shows you the fraction of wells monitoring wells that have more than 50 milligrams per liter of nitrate, and this is the legal limit in Germany, then you see over the last 10 years, the situations did not improve. Yeah? This actually are the wells, the percentage of wells that have more than 25 milligrams per liter of nitrate. Also, this situation does not improve. Yeah? Since two years, we spent millions of euros to solve the situation, and actually the situation in terms of nitrate is not improving. Yeah? I think I give tomorrow another presentation where I specifically address the nitrate problem. It's an extremely interesting problem and also it can be explained why we don't see progress, although we spent a lot of money in order to solve that situation. But these were the four factors I wanted to make why in Germany also managed aquifer recharge is uh, basically a needed technology. And I will show you one example where it's already done. So, what to do? with these four things which are problematic in Germany. This is Frankfurt. Frankfurt is a city which has six, seven hundred thousand people. And if you have large cities, the cities are not able to uh, supply water from local resources. Yeah? And this is, for your country, basically the same. If you have a large city, you have to bring water in from the outside. Most of the water comes from the so-called Hessian Reed, and this is Darmstadt. Darmstadt is somewhere here, there's Darmstadt, and from the region I live in, the water is pumped from the groundwater to Frankfurt. Frankfurt needs about 60 million cubic meters per year, and 90% of that water that goes to Frankfurt is imported from surrounding areas. 30% yeah? comes from the Vogelsberg, the so-called Vogelsberg. People in the Vogelsberg are don't like that anymore. <laughs> they are on their street saying all our good quality water goes now to Frankfurt. We don't want I would like to show you one more point. If you have here now the information that water demand is 60 million cubic meters per year in Frankfurt, I can give you also the information that we have 120 million cubic meters of nicely treated wastewater in two wastewater treatment plants in Frankfurt here, this is Frankfurt again, going into the mine. Yeah? We need 60, we treat 120 million cubic meters and then we put it into the mine and it goes to the North Sea. This is something which is really, we have to think about whether we do the right thing here. Why do we have that large difference between the 60 million and the 120 million? Frankfurt has a lot of sealed, paved areas, of course, as every city. If there's rainfall, all that water goes to the sewer system, goes also into the wastewater treatment plants. It's nicely treated, goes into river mine. So it's not used for managed aquifer recharge. Yeah? So there's a huge resource that could potentially be used, and it's much more than we need, basically, in Frankfurt. However, we do something which is related to managed aquifer recharge, and it's related to the water now in the mine, and the mine, this river here, goes to the River Rhine. This is the Hessian Reed. I showed you that the water for Frankfurt comes from the Hessian Reed. So if you look here into the Hessian Reed, this is where I live, actually. Here is Darmstadt. This is Frankfurt. And this is an agricultural area. Yeah? 
and there's water pumped from the subsurface going to Frankfurt. However, also here we had falling water tables and people were concerned about the situation here in the Hessian Reed because all the water goes to Frankfurt and we don't have it here for the agriculture anymore. Yeah? What people did in the 80s, and this is, a, in my opinion, a great story, they take water out of River Rhine. This is the Rhine that you see here. They bring this water directly out of River Rhine into this water treatment plant in Bibesheim. And this is about 5,400 cubic meters per hour is treated here in that treatment plant to drinking water quality. And then it's used for irrigation and infiltration. And I'll show you the situation here in that area. This is Darmstadt, this is the River Rhine, this is basically the waterworks in Bibelsheim, and all the blue dots you see here are places where water is infiltrated here into the subsurface and later pumped up again for Frankfurt drinking water purposes. In a year, the Bibelsheim plant can treat 43 million cubic meters of water per year. Yeah? And from this water we can infiltrate basically almost 40 million cubic meters per year. No, it's very loud, you have to switch on the microphone. So I did it myself now. <laughs> So, the capacity of the three waterworks that are here in the Hessian Reed are 50 million cubic meters. So, most of the water that goes to Frankfurt from the Hessian Reed here is actually Rhine water. We are taking out of the river Rhine, treated, infiltrated. This is how it looks like. Yeah? Infiltration through trenches. Yeah? Here, water is basically brought from the Bibelsheim plant into such a trench, infiltrated into the subsurface. Here you see that. We have wells. Yeah, large diameter wells where we infiltrate the water. We have former drainage trenches, yeah, now used for area infiltration. So the water from the treatment plant in Bibelsheim goes basically here into these regions and is infiltrated in the Hessian reeds and then pumped out again. Yeah? And we monitor closely water levels. I don't want to go into detail here. This is the 70s. They were pumping water like crazy. And the water levels dropped in the Hessian Reed. And then they realized we have to do something. They stopped pumping first, yeah? But then they needed the water again. And now the infiltration started. And now the water levels are really stable around the target value we would like to achieve. I will give in the end a short outlook. Managed aquifer recharge, as I said, is one piece in the puzzle for sustainable use of water resources and the adaptation to climate change. Technical solutions are quite well understood and efficient. Main problems still are related to pollutants in the water, yeah, and we have to be concerned about that, and we are working on that. In many cases, we have not a tailored and harmonized regulatory framework. This is in the European Union also a problem. People are working right now how to regulate managed aquifer recharge. It's not so easy to do that right now because there is no framework available. Key is to understand the hydrogeochemical processes in the subsurface and to make use of that knowledge. Yeah, I showed you some examples for that. The nitrate example in Barcelona is a great example. You can tailor infiltration. To <laughs> what we did now, we started a new project. This is called Marsolute. Yeah, it started last year and it's running until 2023. Yeah. And we have pretty much the same partners as in the first project. Yeah? And what we have actually in that project now is 12, we call them ESRs. It's again a measure by the European Union. They specifically have projects where you have a lot of PhD students. And these are all our PhD students that we have in the project coming from around the world, basically, to study specific problems of managed aquifer recharge and to try to find solutions. Yeah? And they started a year ago and they have two more years to go to, in the end, reach their PhD. Yeah? That is our project right now. If you would like to know more, there are, of course, two web pages. Yeah? Marsol EU, that is the first project. All the reports we have are here, basically, in results and publications. Yeah? You can just download every single website. The current pro uh, project is Marsolute, yeah, and also there's a website by the EU, the European Union is funding agency in this case also, and that is basically the website. This 
as I said, started a year ago. There's not so much on that website, but we are adding more and more and more materials and publications that come out of this project. And that's it. This is what I wanted to talk about today. So typically what I do, I ask the students whether they have questions in the end. <laughs> and if you have questions, you can just ask questions and I try to answer or put it in the chat function. Also, this is something you can do. Thank you very much for your interesting, very, very, very interesting lecture. Uh, thank you very much. Christoph. Uh, thank you for this, your very, very interesting uh, lecture. And hopefully we uh, meet tomorrow for another lecture titled that the agricultural nitrate problem hydrochemical background. If you, you want to hear this one, I'll do this one. I can also do another one if it's not. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much that you're offering us the, from your precious time. Thank you very, very much for your interested lecture. Thank you. You're very welcome. I enjoyed it also. Have a nice day and we hope to meet tomorrow. Okay. Tschüss. Uh, shuk shukran, Jazeelan. Shukran. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.